Imagine a world without fire and the human capacity to harness it. The San people of the Kalahari are an ancient race. For many thousands of years, they have lived in southern Africa. And for thousands of years, they have made use of fire. The San are an interesting people because they're one of the most ancient peoples on Earth. Uh, they're one of the groups of humans um, which are close to the, the, the sort of root of the human race. And they're making fire and they're showing the way ahead for all humanity. This was the root. This was the physical being. This was the, the root to knowledge. The harnessing of fire by humans predates recorded history. Our use of fire is so much a part of human culture, in fact, that most of us probably don't give it a second thought. But the mastery of fire was one of the greatest turning points in human history. If humans had not learned to harness fire, the world as we know it wouldn't exist. It was the mastery of fire that allowed the development of technologies on which our modern lives depend. Fire enabled cooking, which made it easier for early humans to digest food and gain the calories they needed to nourish their large brains. Fire enabled ceramics, which led to the production of pottery, pipes, bricks and tiles. Fire led to the creation of glass, which produced glassware, windows, plate glass mirrors, and eyeglasses. And fire led to the rise of metallurgy, which allowed us to transform raw ore containing copper, iron, and other metals into utensils, weapons, and tools. Metallurgy, in turn, led to one invention after another. Metal nails, steel, printing presses, steam turbines, telegraphs, internal combustion engines, light bulbs, telephones, automobiles, televisions, computer chips. In short, humanity's mastery of fire was the initial domino that produced a succession of innovations leading to the world we know today. But as critical as fire is to the world we live in, its miraculous powers couldn't have been harnessed just anywhere or by just anyone. In fact, there's only one known planet in the universe designed to reap the benefits of fire. Earth. And there's only one known animal capable of harnessing the power of fire. Humans. In order for our planet to fully realize the life-giving powers of fire, a multitude of precise and exacting conditions had to be met. First, our planet had to have the right kind of atmosphere one that permits both the existence of fire and the existence of a biological creature capable of using it. You need to have an atmosphere that supports both biological respiration and combustion. Um, and it's not, it's, it's, it seems well, you, all atmospheres would be like that, but that's not correct. The, you can arrange this various types of atmosphere with different proportions of nitrogen and oxygen, different atmospheric pressures in which we could breathe and survive okay, but you couldn't make a fire. And there's many, many uh, atmospheres like that. So the first thing you need is you need an atmosphere which, uh, in which we can breathe and which can also support fire. That's condition number one. But to get the right kind of atmosphere, you also need a planet of just the right size. You need to have a planet about the size of the Earth. 
So why, why do you need a rocky planet like the Earth? You need that because if the if planets much larger than the Earth retain their primeval atmospheres, that is, they retain hydrogen and helium, light gases, and the conditions on large planets are incompatible with the sort of atmosphere we have. Only planets of the right size can possess an oxygen-rich atmosphere, which is required if you want to have both respiration and combustion. Planets much larger than the Earth, like Jupiter, retain light gases like hydrogen in their atmospheres by their strong gravitational pull and cannot undergo planetary and atmospheric evolution into a rocky planet like the Earth with an oxygen-rich atmosphere. Planets much smaller than the Earth, on the other hand, can't maintain free oxygen for another reason. A small planet's gravitational pull is so weak that oxygen molecules will float away into space. Only a planet roughly the size of Earth has a gravitational pull strong enough to retain an atmosphere like our own, containing oxygen needed for combustion and respiration, but weak enough so that it won't retain its primordial hydrogen. Our Earth is big enough to retain heavy molecules like carbon dioxide and oxygen and water vapor and things. It's got enough pull to keep them in that it lets the hydrogen and helium go. You need a rocky planet, something of the size of the Earth, to have an atmosphere like ours which will support respiration and combustion. In order to harness the most important benefits of fire, you also need the right kind of fuel. Fuel that can generate fires with sufficient heat. Working with iron typically requires heat in excess of 2100 degrees Fahrenheit or 1200 degrees Celsius. You can't achieve or maintain that sort of heat simply by burning grass or branches. You need coal or charcoal or something equivalent. But the existence of such fuels depends on the flourishing of large woody plants. Those plants in turn are made possible by a molecule known as lignin. Lignin strengthens cell walls, allowing plants to grow taller and it slows the breakdown of organic matter in the soil, providing a soil rich enough to support large trees. Many scientists also believe lignin facilitated the creation of vast deposits of coal in Earth's history by preventing the breakdown of organic matter until it could be fossilized. According to Denton, without lignin there would be no woody plants, no wood, no coal, no charcoal, no fire, no pottery, and certainly no iron and probably no other metals or metallurgy. But even once you have the right kind of fuel, that's still not enough. You also need a living being capable of making and using fire. And to be able to do that, the living being must have a body of just the right size and design. To get a fire sufficiently um, hot to, to, to smelt metals, you really need to have some big chunks of wood or use charcoal or coke. You can't smelt a metal by burning bits of grass. So you've got to be able to hew some wood and assemble a considerable number of you know, blocks of wood to get a really hot fire. I mean, you can't imagine an ant handling fire because it would burn up long before it got to the actual fire. We have just the sort of basic android design to do it. You know, we can, we're quite tall, we've got long arms which we can attach sticks to, so we can manipulate the fire with our arms and of course with our hands we can actually actually get the fire going uh, by, uh, you know, the Boy Scout methods of uh, friction uh, and things like this. So our bodily design enables us to handle a fire, a large fire significantly, which generates significant heat, uh, heat sufficient to smelt uh, metals from the ores. The only biological design of an organism that could handle a fire, make fires and regulate it, seems to be a biological being of a design very similar to our own. I can't think of any other design that would really work. I mean, certainly an elephant won't work, neither will a parrot, and certainly no aquatic organism, however intelligent. I mean, do dolphins are quite intelligent, but even if a super intelligent dolphin could never make a fire because it's living in the water.
and it can't do anything on land. So you've got to be a terrestrial organism of about our size and build to make a fire. It's just, I think that's unique. I think we're unique. Chimp would have difficulty because they're not as manually dexterous as us. Uh, they come closest to an organism that might be able to make a fire, but they don't really have the dexterous fingers that we have. They're not as dexterous as us. Uh, but in any case, a chimp's approaching our Android design. If you look at all the organisms on the Earth, I mean, there's millions of different species. Of all terrestrial organisms, only beings of our basic design are optimized to do this. Uh, and, and I think that would apply throughout the universe. We are uniquely fit to make a fire. A creature that harnesses fire not only needs to be the right size, however, it needs muscles of the right strength. You need to have muscles sufficiently strong to, to raise you off the ground, and that's not a trivial problem. There's a scaling problem. <laughs> the bigger and bigger the organism gets, the less and less relatively powerful it is, its muscles are. And so the fact that we can stand upright depends on the fact that you can have muscles as strong as they are. Um, and in fact, if we had to stand much higher than we are, probably with an android form like us would be impossible. Uh, so you need muscles of a certain strength. Now it so happens that the, the sliding filaments, which are the basis of all biological muscles, are packed to crystalline density in every muscle on Earth. They depend on the weak chemical forces uh, which uh, are involved in the sliding process. So you can't make muscles any stronger than they are. If it were the case that muscles were three or four times less strong, we would never stand upright on the planet's surface. So you need muscles of a certain strength, and it's a close call. A fire-making creature also requires nerves that can transmit messages with the right speed. You need fast nerve conduction, because even walking down the street, your muscles are contracting and relaxing all the time, uh, and it's highly complex. It's, uh, walking is a very complex thing. Fast movement manipulation is a very complex thing. You need very fast nerve conduction to use the muscles to achieve particular ends. And certainly making a fire is very complicated and you need, you know, not only do you need your muscles, you need fast nerve conduction as well. And it so happens that nerve conduction speeds are commensurate with beings like ourselves functioning as mobile entities on the planet's surface. But again, it's a close call. It's almost certainly the case that you couldn't make nerves to transmit the impulse any faster. It's just about as fast as you can get it. <laughs> and it's, and it, that's another close call. But it's not enough to merely have fast nerve conduction. A creature who hopes to utilize fire needs to have nerves that are the right diameter. If our nerve fibers were the size of some of those in invertebrates, for example, our nerve cords wouldn't fit inside our bodies. If the radial nerve supplying the muscles of the arm had to be many times bigger, the nerve cords would almost be as big as the actual arm itself. So you not only have you got to have nerves that conduct impulses very quickly, you've got to have nerves which in fact occupy only a smallish volume of the, um, of, for instance, the limbs, or it would become impossible. In the case of good vision, which you also need to make a fire, the optic nerve would be as big as the head. <laughs> you could never get the optic nerve out. So the diameter of nerve axons the speed of nerve conduction and the power of muscles is all commensurate with a being of our size functioning on a planet like the Earth where you can make a fire. So there's many conditions that have to be fulfilled. We humans seem to have been pre-adapted for our use of fire. And this capability has allowed us to unlock the potential of a vast array of materials throughout nature. But therein lies an even deeper mystery. For the human use of fire to result in new technologies, nature had to be seeded beforehand with compounds and elements with powers that could be unlocked by fire. Such materials don't have to exist, but on our planet, they do. And they exist in abundance. According to Denton, it's as if the materials of nature themselves were prepared beforehand to facilitate our technological development. It's not a new thought.
All this life upon our earth has led up to and culminated in that of man. Alfred Russell Wallace Alfred Russell Wallace was co-founder with Charles Darwin of the modern theory of evolution by natural selection. Unlike Darwin, Wallace believed that evolution had been guided to produce animals like human beings and to produce a world where humans could flourish. In his book, The World of Life, Wallace wrote about the key metals that supply the basis for modern technology, like iron and copper. All of these are widely distributed in the rocks. They are also obtained from their ores without much difficulty, which has led to their being utilized from very early times. Each of the metals has very special qualities, which renders it useful for certain purposes, and these have so entered into our daily life that it is difficult to conceive how we should do without them. Without iron and copper, an effective steam engine could not have been constructed. Our whole vast system of machinery could never have come into existence. Wallace asked whether it was just a fluke that key metals were so useful to man and so readily available throughout the earth. Is it a pure accident that these metals with their special physical qualities which render them so useful to us should have existed on the earth for so many millions of years for no apparent or possible use but become so supremely useful when man appeared and began to rise towards civilization? Wallace didn't think that the existence on our planet of materials necessary for modern technology was just a fluke. He even argued that science itself was dependent on natural capacities pre-built into the chemical elements and compounds from which our world is constructed. To take just one example, Wallace highlighted the critical importance to scientific discovery of the chemical compounds that make possible the production of clear glass. Although most of us probably take it for granted, clear glass has been essential to the development of modern science. Without its use in bottles, tubes, etc., chemistry could hardly exist, while astronomy could not have advanced beyond the stage to which it had been brought by Copernicus and Kepler, it rendered possible the microscope, the telescope, and the spectroscope. Three instruments without which neither the starry heavens nor the myriads of life forms would have had their inner mysteries laid open to us. According to Wallace, the serendipitous features of natural materials pointed to a cause beyond physical nature. We are brought face to face with a body of facts which are wholly unintelligible on any other theory than that the earth and the universe of which it forms a part was constituted as it is in order to supply us with the means of exploring and studying the inner mechanism of the world in which we live, of enabling us to appreciate its overwhelming complexity and thus to form a more adequate conception of its author and of its ultimate cause. And it is impossible to conceive of that cause as other than an all-pervading mind. Like Wallace, Michael Denton believes that humanity's amazing technological success has not been due to our own genius alone. It's also the result of finely tuned conditions and properties of matter that make our technological advances possible. So there's a huge number of conditions that must be satisfied in nature for beings of our biology to thrive, to, be, to thrive and live on a planet like the Earth and make a fire. It's a vast chain of coincidences in nature, and it's each one's a close call. We have reaped the benefits of the technological revolution enabled by our mastery of fire. But our potential to make and use fire seems to have been built into our bodies and into the Earth's biosphere from the very beginning.